A reading from the book of Exodus. Yahweh said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Yahweh settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. The Gospel of Christ. Lord, make us masters of ourselves, that we may become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Please be seated. What you heard in the gospel reading this morning is the episode in Jesus' life known as the Transfiguration. And of course, we already talked a little bit about that at the beginning of the service. But the Transfiguration is significant because not only for the Gospel of Mark, but also in the other gospels, the Transfiguration represents a hinge point, a turning point in the story of Jesus. In the account here with Mark, the first eight chapters have featured Jesus spending his time up in Galilee in the northern part of Israel. But then shortly after the transfiguration, which is in chapter 9, we find in chapter 10, he begins his journey southward to go into Judea, to go to Jerusalem, ultimately for Passion Week to take place, his crucifixion, resurrection, and all of that. So the transfiguration marks a bit of a transition, as it were. 
But it's also significant because of what is said about Jesus, what is understood about Jesus, not only for Peter, James, and John, who were on the mountain with him, but of course for anybody who reads the Gospel of Mark afterwards. And of course, being that this was written about 35 years after the time of Jesus, it really was written so that those who are reading it would learn something about Jesus. But what is it that is learned? What is it that is understood? Well, the first thing that we see is that in our reading this morning, we had a little bit of a backstory, a lead up to this transfiguration event. Jesus and his disciples, as I said, have been in Galilee. We talked last week about how they crisscrossed the Sea of Galilee five times, and it was, you know, something that represented Jesus overcoming the chaos that is uh, a metaphor, well, that the sea is a metaphor for. Uh, He would be on both the Jewish side of the sea and the Gentile side of the sea. If he cast demons out of somebody among a Jewish audience, he also did the same in a Gentile audience. He fed 5,000 on this side, fed 4,000 on on this side, and, and we see him doing all of this. He goes over to Tyre and Sidon and the coast in what is now modern day Le- Lebanon, and, and now Caesarea Philippi is north of the Sea of Galilee. It's, it's about as far north as he can get and still, you know, not get too far out kind of thing. So he's right up top before coming down to the south. And while he is up there, and on his way up there rather, he has a conversation with his disciples, and he's asking them, who are people saying that I am? It's almost as if he's checking in to see if the message is coming across or something. I'm not exactly sure. But the answer that the disciples give is the same thing that we observed last week. He's already understood to be a rabbi, but now there's an awareness that Jesus is something more. And so some people are saying he's John the Baptist. There are still those who believe that he's John the Baptist raised from the dead whom Herod had beheaded. Others think that he's Elijah, and others one of the other prophets. But then Jesus turns and asks them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter, speaking for them all, says, you are the Messiah. And this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus being identified as the anointed one that had been talked about in the Hebrew Bible now comes to light. And so with that declaration, Jesus accepts it. He doesn't correct them. He doesn't qualify it. It's like, okay. The only thing that's interesting is he tells them not to tell anybody about that. And there's all sorts of debate as to why it is that Jesus was trying to keep this a secret. And there's many good reasons for why that may be. We're not going to worry about that right now. But what's more interesting is what happens next. After having received this um, uh, acknowledgement that he is the Messiah, Jesus then very openly begins to tell them, that he is going to have to go down to Jerusalem and be betrayed by people and be killed and three days later rise again, which is not something that any of the disciples were expecting to hear. In fact, Peter, it says in the Gospel of Mark here, rebukes Jesus for saying that. Now, we aren't told what Peter would have said, but we could um, certainly appreciate that Peter is telling Jesus, what are you talking about? Don't say things like that. We just said you're the Messiah. The Messiah can't be killed. That's not how this works. What what are you saying? And what happens instead is Jesus rebukes Peter in a rather notable way. He just says, get behind me, Satan, (laughs) which is like, okay, this is a little bit interesting. Uh, But then he goes on and says, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things, which is an important thing we're going to come back to in a second. Jesus then goes on and starts to talk about the fact, look, if anybody wants to follow me, they have to take up their cross daily and follow me, walk in my ways. Now, when he says, take up your cross, people understand what that's about. He's referring to crucifixion. Now, Jesus hasn't said that he himself is going to die by crucifixion. He has not said that he is going to be crucified but he still used the imagery of crucifixion because everybody that he's talking to would be very, very familiar with it. Crucifixion was the way that the Roman Empire dealt with upstarts and uprisings to keep people under control. Thousands of Jewish people will have been crucified already by this time. You would make a journey from any given city to another and you would see the occasional cross with some decomposed body on it. Someone set up as an example by the Romans not to mess with the iron fist of Rome. 
And Pontius Pilate himself, who was the governor at the time, is, was known for having no problem crucifying people. Sure, yeah, whatever. This guy's causing trouble, just crucify him. That's fine. So when Jesus uses this image of taking up your cross, it's a very vivid and visceral image. And anybody hearing him would have to realize, you know, this is, this is something significant to take on board. And they'd have to ponder that for a while. Well, Jesus says a few more things and, and goes on and, and, and amplifies it, and we don't have time to get into all of that this morning. But then he says, I tell you the truth, some of you here will not taste death without first seeing the kingdom of God come in power. And there even is debate there about what exactly Jesus meant with that statement. But what is interesting is immediately following, we get into the account of the transfiguration. Now, in the gospel, it says six days later. So in, in real time, it's almost a week later that this takes place. But for the reader, it happens right away. And what happens is Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go up to a high mountain. We read in our first reading, Exodus chapter 24, that Moses went up onto a high mountain. And then when they're on that high mountain, Jesus' appearance has changed, and his clothes become so dazzling white that... It's remarkable, like nobody can get it possibly that clean, right? And then he's joined by two men, Moses and Elijah, who are talking with Jesus. And the reason they would have known it was Moses and Elijah is because, ostensibly in the conversation, Jesus would have said, yes, Moses, that's a good idea, or Elijah, you have a good point there, because, of course, nobody would know what these men looked like or anything, but, but there they are identified as these two. And then in the middle of all of this, a cloud comes and envelops them. When Moses was on the mountain in Exodus 24, this very significant cloud came, and it was representative of the presence of God. There was no question about that in Exodus. Here now on the Mount of Transfiguration, the fact that a cloud envelops them and a voice comes from that cloud, nobody's guessing as to what this is. This is the voice of God now. And what the voice of God says is rather remarkable. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Then when the cloud lifts, the disciples just see Jesus standing there. Moses and Elijah are gone. What do we make of this remarkable event? I mean, we talk about it every year, and so a lot of this will be something you've heard before, but it bears thinking about it again. Jesus is there. He's on this mountain. He's kind of doing the same kind of thing that Moses did. And then he's joined by Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law, the Torah, because he's the one that brought the Ten Commandments and everything to the Israelites. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, are traditionally known as the books of Moses. And so here Moses represents the law, the Torah. Elijah, the greatest prophet Israel had, Elijah didn't die. You remember from last week, we read the account of how he had his own ascension. He ascended into heaven, um, chariots of fire, and uh, he's now back, and he represents the prophets. And the law and the prophets are a way of describing the entire Hebrew Bible. And so here, Jesus is on par with Moses and Elijah, that he is someone that is an equivalent to these two guys. So that's already saying something. But then when the cloud comes and says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him, and the cloud lifts and only Jesus remains, well, that's saying something yet again. You see, how to take the voice from the cloud can depend a little bit on how we emphasize the words that are said. If we take it to say that the voice said, listen to him, then the cloud lifts and only Jesus is standing there. Well, then that's showing that what Jesus has to say supersedes what Moses and Elijah had to say. That what Jesus has to say is superseding what the Hebrew Bible has to say. Now, we have to be careful with this because down through the history of Christianity, this kind of thing has led to many abuses of Jewish people at the hands of Christians. And so we must be careful that we do not allow this observation to lead to some kind of conclusion that Christians are better than Jews or that Christianity is inherently better than Judaism or something. That's not what we're talking about here. Let's not forget that at this moment, Jesus is still very much Jewish. 
and he has very much Jewish disciples, and he is in a Jewish context, and this is a continuity of what God has been doing back then through Moses, through Elijah, but now it's being handed on to Jesus, as it were. And so if we take it to mean that the voice from heaven says, listen to him, then we're saying the disciples need to pay closer attention to Jesus now than the attention they are placing on, the, on Moses and Elijah, on the law and the prophets. Now, this shouldn't be a big surprise because we've already seen that as Jesus has been going around teaching, people were remarking that he's teaching with authority. He's not teaching like the scribes do who would simply say, well, let's look back and see what Moses said. Let's look back and see what the prophets say. Okay, here you go. Jesus is taking it to another level. He's already been doing that. So the voice of heaven is saying we need to recognize Jesus is bringing about the culmination of what has already gone before. But then we can also emphasize this as being listen to him. And when we hear it that way, we can see a connection with the immediate conversation they had had. Let's recall just a few verses earlier, even though in the story it was a week ago, when you're reading it, you just saw just a few verses earlier, the disciples say, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus says, and I'm going to have to die. And then Peter rebukes him. And then Jesus rebukes him back and says, you're not putting your mind on divine things, but on human things. And now the voice from heaven says, listen to him. It's almost as if the voice is meant to say, hey, guys, you didn't want to accept what Jesus had to say here, but listen to him. In fact, he's going to tell you two more times that he has to die and rise again. And it's interesting that they didn't really key on the rising again part. The main concern was that he would talk about dying. But perhaps that's part of what this voice is trying to say. No, listen to what he's talking about. And I think that's certainly part of the package. But there's no way that we can say that that is the end of it all. When the voice from heaven says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him, what that means, of course, we have to hear what he's saying. We have to pay attention to what he's teaching. We have to look into what it is that he is communicating. And this is a good reminder for us because a lot of times, especially when it comes to Jesus, especially when it comes to trying to emphasize why is Jesus important to us, if we ever wanted to share that with somebody else, a lot of times we want to zero in on the miraculous things that he did. You know, he calmed the sea, right? That's part of the gospel of Mark. And he cast out demons from people, and a paralyzed man got to rise up and walk, and and he, uh, you know, has has multiplied loaves and fishes, and there's this amazing zoomy things that Jesus does, and it's easy to look at that. Why is Jesus special to us? Well, because he works miracles. Really? Is that why? I would suggest that the voice from heaven is saying exactly the opposite. That The reason Jesus is special is not because of the miraculous things that he's done but because of what it is he had to say. Now, obviously, there's no denying that as we read the Gospel of Mark, one account after another about miraculous things that Jesus does comes out. But let's also not forget that Jesus will say in the coming chapters, watch out because there will be false prophets who will also do miraculous signs. In the Hebrew Bible, we see examples of that. In the book of Exodus, when Moses is going to confront Pharaoh at the beginning and tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go from slavery, one of the things Moses does is he takes his staff and he throws it on the ground and it becomes a serpent. Yeah, but then the Egyptian magicians throw their staves down and they become serpents too. Now, Moses' snake eats theirs, so there is that. But the point is that they were able to make their staves become snakes too. When Moses announces the first plague and the Nile River is turned to blood, the Egyptian magicians are able to turn water into blood too. There is actually no shortage of zoomy things happening in the Hebrew Bible being done by people who are not just the ones really close to God. What's going on with Jesus' miracles? Well, they're drawing attention to him. 
They're raising the bar, as it were. They're causing people to see him. But if we think that Jesus is all about the miracles, well, I would suggest we're thinking not about divine things, but about human things. We're looking at the thing that catches our attention. So what are the miracles about then? Well, one thing is for sure. They definitely, as I said, draw attention. Uh, in the Gospel of John, he'll refer to them as miraculous signs, pointing to something. But, but again, just in Mark alone, we see that Jesus is gaining attention by doing these things. And let's not forget that the miraculous things that he does benefits somebody else. When he calmed the sea, the disciples were no longer fearful for their lives on this storm. When he casts a demon out of somebody, the person is, deliverance, is delivered. When he raises the, para, the paralyzed person so he can walk again, he's now healed. You know, when Peter's mother-in-law has her fever rebuked, you know, she is now no longer sick. The person on the receiving end of Jesus's miraculous signs benefits somehow. That's saying something. But that's all it can say. I mean, what else is there to learn from his miracles? Okay, he can do zoomy things. Well, other people were able to do that too. So what makes Jesus distinct? The voice from heaven tells us, listen to him. It's what Jesus has been saying that is of vital importance. And so if we review the previous eight chapters, what are the things that Jesus said? Well, we start off in chapter one. He began to proclaim the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Change your thinking and believe this good news of God that I'm telling you. And then he goes on and he talks about the nature of the kingdom of God. In chapter 4, we have the four parables, the parable of the sower and the growing seed and the mustard seed. And we learn that the good news from God is scattered indiscriminately to everybody. It's not like only reserved for certain people. We, We learn that it grows on its own. We learn that as it grows, it becomes something immense that actually benefits things that are not even intrinsic to itself. You know, the mustard bush becomes a a tree in which birds can nest. We learn about the fact that, um, uh, and here's where the fatigue is kicking in. (laughs) But as we we look back over his his teaching, we, we see him talking specifically about the fact that he did not come to save the righteous, but sinners that the people on the outside are the ones he's looking for, not the people who figure they've got it all figured out already. He is one who touches the leper and includes the people that have been, perhaps for good reasons, kind of on the fringe, but he goes out to them in compassion to include them. He has dinner parties with tax collectors and other sinners to show them that the presence of the kingdom of God is among them too, and not just the professional religious people. These kinds of things that Jesus is teaching all lead up to the transfiguration, and then we're going to see in ensuing chapters that he has more to say as well. And this voice from heaven is telling us what Jesus has had to say is the important part. And this makes sense when you think about it. Because if we are going to respond to his initial call to change our thinking because the kingdom of God has come near, we'll change our thinking into what? How do we go there? Where do we go with that? And if Jesus' teaching is, is somehow different from the others, what kind of thing is he moving toward? Let me suggest to you that what Jesus' is teaching is doing is not teaching us what to think, but how to think. Teaching us what to think is a very elementary way of learning. We do that with young children. This is good, this is bad. You should do that, don't do that. And it's very simple, it's straightforward. We're concerned about their safety, we're concerned about them getting along with others, but it's pretty clear, do this and do this, good and bad, black and white, this is what you are supposed to do, this is how you are supposed to, uh, what you are supposed to be thinking. But learning how to think enables us to go into whatever circumstance we find ourselves and understand how to approach that circumstance. 
so that chances are really good you and I are never going to encounter a leper. But knowing that Jesus touched the leper to bring wholeness to him, is what motivated the church early on to establish hospices, which eventually became hospitals. To the extent that today, of course you have hospitals in your society. Of course you take care of sick people. It wasn't always like that. When we see the way that Jesus reached out to others in compassion, then it means as we encounter people, all right, how should I be facing this situation? What would a compassionate response be to this circumstance, whatever I'm facing? What do I do when I see a person in need? What do I do if I see a couple of people in conflict? Do I ignore it? Do I try to intervene? What's the right answer? You can't just tell somebody, oh, do this every time you see somebody in conflict. Instead, it's better for us to understand that is there some way in which I can help this situation? Is there some way that I can bring light or peace into this circumstance? Learning to think along those lines is what Jesus is driving at, which is part of the reason why he rebukes Peter. When Peter says, look, I just said you're the Messiah. Now you say you have to die. That doesn't work. Messiahs don't die. That's the rule. And Jesus is saying you're not thinking the right way. You've got one picture locked into your mind, but there's something else you need to see. And then he goes on and says, take up your cross daily and follow me. To be able to do that requires that we think differently. To be able to do that requires that we understand our entire approach to life is to be informed by the character of God, the character of the kingdom of God, and the implications of the things that Jesus had to teach. The miracles alone don't tell us how to live. The zoomy things don't inform us as to what kind of people we are supposed to be. And the fact that we can't do miracles ourselves makes it even harder for the miracles to inform us. Oh, yeah, just go out there and heal that guy, will you? Uh, Sure, I'll get right on that. Like, that's not how it goes. But when we look at Jesus' teaching, we understand more of what kind of people we are to be, which is why I opened this sermon with one of those three prayers I usually work. I usually use before a sermon, Lord, make us masters of ourselves that we may become the servants of others. That's the calling we have as followers of Jesus. And Mark chapter 6 made a big point of that, that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. We are to do the same thing. Take our minds and think through them, I prayed. Let us allow the mind of Christ to transform our thinking so that we know how to approach this. Take our mouths and speak through them. Let the words that we share be ones that give life and peace and comfort. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Let it be that this transfiguration event that we read about in the gospel not only transforms Peter, James, and John, but may it transform us as we take those words to heart. This is my son, the beloved, Listen to him. Amen.